Ok, já jsem si tu dostal k tomu, že jsem si myslel, 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 že to nám ako pravšie, ktoré by bohate stačí, ako budete aj zvým sa dám rádom veľký robiť. A tá informácia je taká, že je to je. Aké je božstvo obrázkov? Toto tu spustím. A... Čiže... Tu je, že zdropa máme zdravých fotiek, nejakých 60, SK, nejakých 70 niečo, suchý pár, to, že okolo 40, tidákov okolo 40, no tej tidáky to okolo 40, čo to tam je, ale to je ešte dneska koniec. Niekto ako, že znamená, že stále ešte štádium porobí dneska. Čiže toto je naša zase druhá dosťov. Vidíte, že tých potiek, dajme tomu, že nie je veľa, ale rozvýkajte si, tak to proste chodí v mešom o tom, že i dá čas, to je málo. Ale napriek tomu, keď máme zhruba okolo 200 potiek, vo všetkých tých kategóriách, ale vy si viete rozpacovať tie potky, na menšie otázky, po chvíľu vidíte prečo, lebo nám v podstate stačí nejaký taký jeden list niekedy na tej cílove. Dobre, tu môžem také, že ukážiť tie otázky. Čiže tu napríklad je, že ako to sú nejaké štýmy náhodné obrázky, z toho to zase tu, že ako vyzerajú tie zdravá. Čiže vidíte, kvácne bujné zelené deti, alebo to je dobrá úplná. Tak, ono, ako to zrejme na SK, tak to vyzerá nejak takto. Čiže sú tam už, keď to ani zúdne niekde, aby bolo jasné, je to napríklad také, že je to niečo červené. To je na S, alebo tu niekde... Tak nejak to vyberá, čiže nie je to tak, že by ten list opadal, ale čo? Ale proste začne tak červený, nejak tak. Čiže toto je, jak vyberá na kapitická S. A potom máme tu rostoč. Rostoč je taká vec, že sa mi celkom povedá... No, to sú také malé červené pohľadky. Čiže toto je rozpoč, toto je niečo čo... Je to vlastne problém? Problém to nie je, akože je to len kozmetická chyba. Ako? Je to len rozpoč, je kozmetická chyba. Čiže toto v podstate môžeme dať do tej kategórie, aký by stráve len s tým, že to môžem pomýliť na žaboritnosť pri učovaní jesky. Potom máme, že suché. Tie sú celkom v pohode, nebo to tam v podstate je to dosť podrieba výdušne. A potom je také, že kombinované. To sú také, že máme tam obi dve kategórie. Aj preto sú to ako kombinované, čiže tie obrázky potom môžu si človek nejak rozpracovať na časti, že tu sú tej časti obrázky práve v tej časti súťa, v tej môžu je tak ďalej. A to je všetko. Čiže toto je taký základné obrázky, ako to všetko vyzerá. Dôležité je, čo si tu človek môže všimnúť, je, že už my ako ľudským okom vieme posúdiť, čo to tam je. Keď proste pozrieš na list a nemusíš vidieť nejaký extra expert, aby si povedal zdravý list, SK, rozpoč, alebo čo, alebo iba je ľudí pod zdravý a SK, alebo už podstatná SK. A to je dobrý znak. Pri machine learningu platí také pravidlo, že väčšinou, keď máme dobrú human performance, keď človek je svojimi smyslami, oči, uši a tak ďalej, niečo spraviť, tak to znamená, že to bude vedieť zrejme, aj to sú v podstate skúsenosti ľudí, čo v podstate si vieš, tak je tam dobrá práce, že to bude vedieť aj zrejme, že to bude vedieť. Tak, čiže, čo je taká prvá vec, čo sa dá všimnúť, je, že dosť tam hrá rolu farma, že? Čiže prvá vec, čo vás asi prirodzene a páči, čo by sa to mohli ďalej, je, že skúsme ich nejak klasifikovať na základe farby. Tak robil som parejnú segmentáciu, čiže také, že... 
A všetky zdravé obrázky, aké mám, to je to kopy. A pozriem sa najprv na ten kanál, každý obrázky, aký ten kanál je vedľký, pozriem sa napríklad na red kanál, že ako to tam vyzerá. Čiže tu mám napríklad červený kanál tých obrázok a histogram, čo sa týka tých pixelov. Čiže tie pixely sú rozmerzy od 0 po 1, keď sú na to, že klasicky sú nakrapované tie hodnoty. A čisto keď zo zdraví všetkých zoberiem a priemeruje, alebo zoberiem všetky a ščítam, že koľko je tu početnosť jednotlivých pixelov v danom rozmerzi. Čiže napríklad od 0 20 do 0 50 je tu proste jednu toľko mera a tak ďalej. Čiže klasické histogramy. Toto je pre červený kanál, toto je pre zelený kanál a toto je pre modrý kanál. Čiže skúsme tu niečo také, že napríklad sme tam videli na tých fotkách, že SK má červené tam, že? Čiže pozrieme sa na ten červený kanál v SK, je tam viac červenej ako u ostatných. Čo myslíš? Ale to je to vzadu je občerstvenie, aj keby ste boli, ale to urobíme si technickú predstavku niekedy, ty povedz, že kedy. Čiže dva polke? Môžeme také. OK. Tak, ešte taká otázka, že je niečo na tých histogramov, čo sa vám nepáči? Čo by ste spravili inak? Čo sa vám zdá, že nedá sa to na základe toho dobre porovnať, ako je to teraz správne? Môžete to dáme vám nejakú škálu? Čo ten rozsah podľa nastaviť na nejakú jednotnú škálu? No, ktorý rozsah podľa? Keď si mám ktorým slovom rozsah. Tak, super. Dobre. Čiže aj to bol taký, že či dávate pozor. Hej, lebo tie histogramy sú sa zrejme dvoje, ale tie sú vyvolené. Čiže keď to je pravda rovná, to rovná, tak budete tak len hodne nejaké také. Ale čo my chceme, a rovno prejdem k tomu, ak je už všetko dobre stávané. Čiže v prvom rade, čo som tu spravil, som tu dal také, že je tu funkcia na histogram, tak je tu také, že density, ktorú som si vyjadil, 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 Integrál toho tu je jedna, alebo toto tu všetko, keď počítate, to je jedna. Čiže to je tak nalávať. No a tiež ešte som tu dal pre jednu kategóriu, aby tá Y bola presne od 0 po 2. Čiže toto už tak je tak, jak má byť a môžeme to vizuálne porovnať. Čiže teraz sa už na to pozrieme takým skúmaným okom. Vieme na základe toho, toto je červený kanál najprv, niečo povedať? Tak sa vás pýtam, myslíte si na základe toho histogramu, že v Eske je viac červenej ako v zdraví? To podľa mňa hejde, lebo tu je maximum niekde okolo 0,2. Čiže toto je že 0,2 je strašne slavá červená, čiže 0 takto je, 0 je jakoby čierna a 1 je totálne, že najsitejšia červená, ako to môže byť. Čiže tu 0,2 mám maximum a tu mám maximum niekde ďalej 0,3 a celkovo ten histogram je veľmi posunutý po tým väčším hodnotám, čiže je väčšia pravdepodobnosť výskytu hodnot tých červených, v tom červenom kanáli, u S. 
Hej, čiže OK, už z toho výstupu gramu začal sa dá povedať, že napríklad je to dva, ale potom na potvoru sa pozriete, ako sa má rozdrž a suché. A tam je to nejak ešte inak divné. Čím by to mohlo byť tak prosto, či je tak? Áno, tam proste sú aj nejaké zároveň a tak. Čo sa týka suchého, tam to vyzerá, že tie červené je totálne najviac. To je na tú maximum, ktorý je tak neúkonné, že je čo nás na 5, 2, 2, 6. Viete, máte nejaký nápad, prečo by to tak mohlo byť? Čiže tá, tá modrá farba, 
Ja som sa teraz chcel spýtať o tom, že keď vlastne vytvoril ľudia, že vlastne si sa napísal, a v tom smysle, že vlastne to, to, čo to musí s tým dopracovať, vlastne by bolo to zostávať výkazí, či je to úplne ako aj z tejto výpadce sa tam. Ten niekdy práve je nejaký feature, ako že vlastne tam si budúme tie feature, ale ty si začal s tými fajnými dokumentáciami, tak vlastne to si budú feature, a to je vlastne fajn. Ale teraz som začal, že zase v tom, ale tej aplikácii si vieš, či povedujem na ktoré odpozorovať ten detail. A to je, ja neviem, možno nejak segmentáciu toho, že vyberiem na tej listy z toho. Takže s tým nejakým, teda za tým nejakým, ktorým sa zaujíma, že či nie je veľa lepšie za detail, ale to celá ako nejaké tak tie boky, pardon. Čiže vlastne povedeme si, že dejka tak asi na tej spravedu to je to pohľad. Potom prebudeme to, že vlastne teraz sú ľudia, ktoré čo viem sa budú sú, na ktoré sa súpeží, a na tej spravedu to vlastne 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 vlastne
Ej, to bude v podstate dávno vám dota, čo je úsku do práce, ktorú môžem si to nový Zoberiem obrazu, napríklad červený kanál a mám tam, keď to je napríklad 600x600, mám tam pre každý pixel nejakú hodnotu intenzity červený, bo tu má to jedno. No a teraz urobím istú na týchto hodnotách. Čo to je tam tých hodnotách, že mám tam tých hodnotách. A teraz si ten istú na tých hodnotách zde tie tých hodnotách. Na novým hodnotách. Tak, aby ich proste obsah povieť. A to je v podstate tá hodnota, že v podstate, kde som mám 10 pínov, tak to je pekne to, že to presne udáva percentuálne. Takže 20% je v tomto intervále, 30% je v tomto intervále. Čiže toto budú moje pičúry. Každý obrázok budem reprezentovať nejakými takými pičúrovými číslami. Keď tak som si to zvolil. Ako už kolega tam povedal, nie je to úplne ideálny prístup, pretože môže sa meniť osvetlenie. Ale akože pre začiatok dajme tomu, ale ne taký akože workshop, ktorý môže snažiť potom dávať na tom debatu, že ako by sa to dalo potočiť. To je len prípad. Dobre. Tak. Čo sa stane je na to, že si to v podstate vyrobím. Čiže pre každý jeden obrázok si vyrobím tých 30 features a ich povedzujem. Čiže to už je ten ideálny step. Potrebujem to nejako dostať do algoritmu. Potom už keď začne nejaký klasifikačný algoritm robiť, tak oni chcú nejaký taký vstup, že že sa to volá, že x, nejaký vektor, má sa x, tá vstupná, že tam mám pole 30 čísel a vstup je plasa dráve, alebo plasa mimo, si to označí. Čiže toto vám chcem nejak dostať do nejakého takého stavu, čiže mám to tu, že tu mám napríklad tým z 0, má týchto tu 30 pičerov a má label 0, to znamená dráve pre mňa. Potom tu nejaké na konci. Tu je label 3, čo je u nás suché. Taký je 81, má taký 30 pičerov a taký 30 pičerov. Toto keď má, už sa končí pri procesie v zárezom u nás a ideme to fidovať na nejakých algoritmu. Teraz, čo tu akože robiť? Tak, rozhodol som sa, že napríklad skúsime pre začiatok rozhodovací strom. Rozhodovací strom je taký algoritmus, že vidíte potom aj to, keď na hodnote viete, že to presne funguje. Je to fajn vec, lebo je to veľmi ľahko interpretovateľná. On v podstate robí presne to, čo ja som chcel robiť ručne, že nachádzať nejaké trežolty v tom a rozdeľovať to na triedy. Takže napríklad, ak som mali v tom červenom, že keď od 0,3 do 0,4 intenzita červeného kanálu je viac ako 0,6, tak to bude S. Keď to je menej, tak to budú všetky ostatné triedy. Čiže taký nejaký Trešol tam nájsť ideálny, to môžem určite, ale nemusím, sú na to optimalizované algoritmy. A rozhodovať si s tom je presne tak, že keď tam tých 30 features, tak on sa s nimi pohrá, kaď ja to optimalizuje, od zvedzené môžete, ktoré musí vyjsť, a vie si to optimalizovať, že tie feature rozdeliť, ktorú feature, tak, aby som potom tu vedem prekne rozdeliť na nejaké tých feature. Tu v podstate to skutím. Sme zhruba v polke prednačky. Pauzu. Môžem si dať. Takže pauzu.
right? And this, we are going to feed into some algorithm, some classification algorithm. And as I said earlier, we will choose decision tree classifier. Well, that's pretty easy. And it's <coughs> the great advantage of decision tree is that it's nicely interpretable, right? So you can very easily look and see why does the algorithm um, did this decision based on some, some rule or something like that. And I will visualize this in a later stage if you can see, right? So, so decision tree is pretty cool, and especially guys or customers which uh, like that the results are interpretable, so you actually can tell them that, okay, this algorithm says that this is ESCA because this, this, this happened. This is very easy and very nicely visualizable in, in decision trees. So, this will run decision tree. Remember, we have our axes, which are basically every image has 30 pictures and labels, and I will fit it with this decision tree. Uh, it has depth 5. What is basically depth? If you don't know, you will see in a minute. So I will just run it. And there is some accuracy coming out. So, so far with this, okay, so what I have done is basically is I did first train test split. This is a standard way with continuous dimensional learning problems. That's what you always do, right? If you want to be fair and you want to be fair. So, uh, you take your data set, for example, 200 pictures, and you take, for example, 160 of them, and you train your classifier on these 160, and then you take these 40, and after the classifier is trained, you just check what is basically the performance of your algorithm on these 40 images, right? So this is very, very important that you will not so-called overfit your data set, because if you don't do this split, then it's like the results are, are not usable. Your algorithm needs to be general, generalizable for images that uh, you have not seen during the training. Right? So this is very important. Because, of course, you have a product, you have an algorithm, you have a model, and then Dushan will come and give you another picture. And so the real issue is that what will be the performance of your algorithm on the new images, right, that were not seen before. Okay. Uh, Let's visualize this. And here we have it. So, this is the decision tree that we just trained. And what it says is, at the top level, so this is uh, in depth number one, we have, okay, so I have named these features, like for the red color is red 0, 1, 2, up to 9, and green from 0 up to 9, and blue from 0 up to 9. So the algorithm says that if you take blue free feature, which is basically this feature, right? so blue 0, blue 1, blue 2, blue 3. So this blue free feature, if you take this value, and if you threshold it, if it's less than 1.25, then you will we will be here, I will comment in a second what it is. And if it's more than 1.5, we will be here. Uh, okay, we have 148 samples here, so this is our training set. And here you can see uh, for these four classes so far at the beginning how many images we have for our training set. So 47, that's the first class, that was in my case uh, the healthy ones, then the ESCA, then uh, the <laughs> Cockroaches or something like that. <laughs> and bugs. Bugs. Okay. Let's, let's and, and then some try, try leads. This is right. number two. Sort of okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then if we did this split, you can see that in this first uh, first part in the left, if, if this condition was true, here you, for example, see that. We have 109 samples, 23 <coughs> out of 47 for the healthy ones. And what is really interesting is that just this one simple condition can classify all the ESCA, uh, ESCA images, because all 60 are here, and here are zero. Right? 
<coughs> so this is the training set. But if you will then put some new data point there as a test set, it will fail. I mean, it will be worse than this one, right? And what we really care about is test set, right? We don't care that much about training set. This test set is, is the one that will be in the production. Right? So, for example, if you have 10 points, if you're doing linear regression and you're fitting it with polynomial of order 9, then of course you will always fit it perfectly because you have 10 free parameters, 10 data points, so, so it will always be zero. The error will be zero, right? And this is overfitting. We have a question. Just, just a yeah. simple comment. Have you noticed that it is exactly what Einstein said? What did you say? The model must be as, as simple as possible, but not. not yes. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. We don't know actually if Einstein said that, but Google says yes, but we don't care. But we don't care. It's the highest rate. So, uh, yeah, and this is actually how you can detect overfitting. If you look at your training accuracy is 96%, which means that out of your 140 images, for example, 96% of them were correctly classified. But your test set is just 48%, right? So, so this is overfitting. If you look at another plot, 9370 is still pretty high. 9137, oh my god, too big, and, and so on. So, so we are definitely overfitting. If you're using the decision tree classifier, how to deal with this? Probably the only way I learned right now is to, to use lower depth, right? Because the more the high is the depth, then the more prone you are to overfitting. And, and this is always the case. So, so if you will use this, for example, free, then it will be much better. Okay, so, so for the test. See that it's 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 slightly better, right? It was like 40 and stuff like that. So, so the test score is better, but the train score is lower. That's the, that's the thing. We are still overfitting, if you see, but it's not the high overfitting, right? So this is the case. Okay. Another thing that I really really like is what is called confusion. I will just run it here and then we'll explain what actually happens there. Confusion matrix. So, for some classifier, decision tree classifier that we just trained, you have here, these are the true labels, right? So, this is the, for our test set, we know that <clears throat> this is, for example, healthy, leave, but, and these are the predictive labels. Right, so, so which ones we actually said that it is healthy. So if, if everything is great in our algorithm, there will be non-zero elements just on the diagonal. Right, because here is, for example, nine. So we have nine images that were actually healthy, and we classified them as healthy. But then we have one that was actually extra. No, no, it was actually healthy, but we classify this as S right? And this confusion metric is, is so amazing because very quickly it can tell you where your algorithm is failing, right? Because this should be, all these non-diagonal elements should be zero. Okay. So for example, if you look at this, what can we improve in our, in our algorithm? These leaves with bugs, uh, we are predicting them too many times, right? We are predicting it here, even though it's SK, we are predicting it here, even though it's healthy, right? But actually, yeah, but here are three that were actually bugs, but we missed them. We classified them as SK, right? So, so this is the thing that you, you can look at and quickly see that what's going on. And then you can adjust your algorithm. Look at these features that actually have to look at this uh, visualization and, and see what actually happens. Okay, so this is confusion matrix. This 
this was a decision tree classifier. One, another classifier that I would like to show you is called logistic regression. This is, um, again, a very standard model. Of course, we need more to have a standard one. Today. Okay, so if you know what is linear regression, okay, what is linear regression is that you have some features. In our case, we have 30 features. And you want to predict some, some variable, right? For linear regression, that variable is continuous, right? So we can be float. <laughs> IT guy. And logistic regression, the only difference between linear regression and logistic regression is that you perform here within these square brackets, you perform linear regression, there's nothing else. So, so here, R, I, what I noticed here, so this sum goes from 0 to 9, and R, I, this is the I bar of our red channel histogram. Right? So R0, R1, R2 will be here. Then chi I, this is the I bar of our green channel histogram. And the same for PI. Right? So we have all our 30 features here. And these coefficients, ARI, AGI, ADI, are basically the coefficients that we want to fit. Right? So, so this is linear regression. The difference in logistic regression is that your output variable, you don't want it to be uh, continuous. You don't want it to be flow. You want it to be some category. category, right? So, so you always, the standard way, you apply some function. Usually it's a function called sigmoid. Looks like this. Don't worry, it's, it's pretty strange. It's heuristic and stuff like that. It's not very easy to show why you got to this function, but leave it to, to academic people. But what is important here is that this function, if it's very, very low, or it goes to zero, and if it's high, it goes to one. Right? So, so if you will have here in the square bracket, if you get a number, for example, 0 0.5, and if you perform sigmoid of it, it will be somewhere here. What's important, it will be positive. Okay, and uh, not positive, but more than 0 0.5. And otherwise, if, if this output of this linear regression is something negative, then it will be here. And what you do here, you say that let's imagine, let's interpret that these will be actually the probability uh, that this image will be classified as, as this label. Right? Because this is from 0 to 1, which is perfect for probability. Right? So, so this is actually why we use this sigmoid function. Right? So if you do sigmoid of, of something that is positive, you will have probability that is higher than 50%. If you do sigmoid of something that is negative, you will have probability that is lower than 50%. The something is called score. Score. Yes. Any other combination of the function is called score. <coughs> score, you mean like a score sign. Okay. So this is how they call it. Okay. So we are going to train a linear regression model based on our previously defined 30 features. Let's run it. And it's here. So I fit it with a train set and then I calculate what is the score, so how many of these were correctly classified for the test set. And you see here that it's about 70%, which is better than it was in the case of decision tree classifier, if you remember, right? So, and, and remember that we are actually classifying into four groups, which is like more difficult than just two groups, right? Because if we want to even boost the performance even more, we can just say like ESCA and non ESCA, right? And, and it will be just binary classification, and then and it can be about 70% for just a simple model on four classes. That's, that's pretty good, I would say. Okay. Uh, this parameter C is pretty important here. Why? Okay, so let's let's first perform, because uh, this was just one 
train that it's doing, right? And you remember that I said that it's not very hard to do this. So let's do cross validation, right? And ten follows. Yeah, let's say ten follows. So it be ten follows. So again, it was performed on ten follows, and you can see so train score eighty six, test score seventy. Okay, eighty three, seventy five, eighty three, eight. So first thing you can see that it's not that it's still overfitting a bit, but not that much as was for the case of decision tree, right? And that's that's very nice. Right? So you can see at these test scores they are, are pretty nice. Okay, like for example here we're at zero point forty seven, so that's still not good. So let's let's look if we can boost this by tuning this parameter. So you have what is called parameters. Parameters are basically the variables that, that you are fitting, right? In our case, that's these 30 features. And then you have what is called hyperparameters. So these hyperparameters are something that you just tune your model with, right? So you don't fit them, actually, maybe manually, but but you don't want to fit them, right? It's, it's just uh, to, to change something in the algorithm in some way. This C algorithm, uh, C parameter, hyper. What it actually does is the strength of regularization. What is regularization? It is something to deal with the overfitting. So if you have your model that is overfitting, what you can do in decision tree, we couldn't do this, but for these logistic regression, linear regression, neural network, which are basically just extension of logistic regression, we can use this, we can use this regularization and, and uh, this way, we can reduce overfitting. What it actually does, it will push the, the coefficients, these parameters that we are fitting, to lower and lower values, so they will not be that high. Yeah, we can fit here. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's do this parameter. So, if it's, okay, how this parameter works, the higher it is, the lower is the regularization, right? And if we want higher regularization, because we are overfitting, right? So our train and test score are different. Then we want to tune this parameter to lower values. So for example, let's try 0.3. So we can see this is smaller. Yeah, and here. Because here, what I have basically, it will take these test scores, it will calculate the average of them, and plus minus the standard deviation. Right, so, so for C equals 1, it was 75 plus minus 10. Okay, so that's still a pretty high range, but okay. And if I tune this to 0 0.2 lower value, So, so we didn't help. Okay, so, so let's try to make it even lower values for the rest. Yeah, even worse. <laughs> That's not how it should be. <laughs> yeah, when I was trying to do it, it worked. Uh, the thing is that there are random splits. I should have <laughs> saved the, the random state, okay, whatever. But uh, the thing is that if this happens, that just means that your algorithm is probably at the end, right? Or so it is overfitting. I cannot help it, right? So it will stay overfitting. Okay. So okay, let's maybe we hit one. So let's try to. Like even if you if you go to higher, it will be just a bit. Okay. If we will try to make higher values, we'll see if we can tune the, the precision to even better values. So 
This way, remember that you can always tune your hyperparameters, and this way, you can cross validate. Always check if your model is not overfitting. And if it is, just use this C parameter to try to tweak it. And The training of the logistic regression, for example, what actually happens is you are looking for some global optima of loss function. Okay, so you define some function that you want to minimize, right? That function is basically um, you want to minimize the distance between how it should be and how it is right now for your given iteration, right? If you know what is root mean square error, that's that's it. So if you don't use regularization at all, or when we see goes to infinity, uh, then you will have just this. So your function to minimize, to find global minimum of your parameters, will be just this root mean square error. If you turn on a regularization, what happens is that your function that you want to minimize, there is one extra term plus, and what this extra term contains are that you have the sum of all your parameters squared. What that means that this function will be minimal when these parameters will be closer to zero, right? Because they are all these parameters squared, right? So, so you have not just one term root mean square error, but you have two terms now. So this first term will try to fit your model, but at the same time, the second term will try to. <laughs> We'll try to keep your parameters small because, yeah, so, so you want to minimize this function. If you will have a table, that would be nicer, but yeah, at least. Okay. So, so this is what this regularization does. Because if you have parameters that are lower, then your model is less complex. Now, our favorite confusion matrix. So, for the logistic regression, let's see what is the confusion matrix. Like here. So, again, for example, you can see that it's better as it was for the decision tree. But what you can focus on on your next iteration of algorithm is the group that, okay, so we have some SK predicted here three times, but it was actually not. Okay, so I need to think about some features of some further pre-processing that will actually distinguish between these leaps with bugs and these things. And so, so this confusion matrix can tell you a lot about this. Can, can... Okay, this was the classification for the four classes. But here, let's try just Leaves that are healthy and all the others. Okay? Before I didn't know that actually these with bugs and these dry ones are actually good ones or not the bad ones, I would say. So this classification was not that correct. But still, let's let's keep it uh, for our purposes. There is a kind of difficult to change. So uh, we all our data set is basically the same. The only thing that changes is that we don't have labels in four classes. We just have labels that healthy and all the others. So zeros and ones. Why I want to do this, you will see. Okay, so, so like this, right? So, so these are all our labels. So the zeros are the healthy ones, and ones are our uh, S or dry ones or leaves in the class. And let's do the same thing. So let's run the logistic regression again. And here you can see that immediately we have higher values here, right? Because it's much easier for the classifier to classify just between two classes instead of four classes, right? So, so the trade score is 90, test score is even higher. Wow, that's cool. And if you have here another fault, 91 for the train set and test score 89, right? So, so you can see that here we have even 100% accuracy on this. But of course, you need to make some average of this. So let's do the average and standard deviation is 82, right? 
So, so if you classify just the two classes, already this super simple classifier, which is pretty standard, gives us 82 plus minus 0 0.12. Can you please run it once again? Just you want to see if it is not perfect. No, this is, uh, it will always be the same. There is no randomization. So this is not. Yeah. Uh, the only randomization that is, is uh, if, if you uh, do the splitting between test and train set, but this is done automatically. Uh, so you just take all your data set and first of all, nine tenths train, and the last tenth will be the test, and so on. Probably there is some parameter that will you need to get into a competition that will shuffle the data or we can manually shuffle the data and then try again. But I think if we have ten folds, that's already good statistics, right? So we can say that this value and it you know, also standard deviation here. So I can pretty confidently say that doing this algorithm, the accuracy will be always higher than 7%. I was okay. just curious about those uh, external uh, mm -hmm. cases where there is one point of accuracy. Okay. And for this, ah, uh, usually it comes from the right? So you can see that now it looks like this. Right? So, so the thing is, that we have here six images that we classified as not healthy as the other ones, but they were actually healthy. And that's okay. And we have here one that is we classified as healthy, but it was not. Now, the crucial question that will come from the business perspective is that which one of these is more important? Because we can tweak some parameters, you will see in a minute, to have maybe six here and one here. So what is more important for us? To have a smaller value here or a smaller value here? Because these are the two correctly classified. Right? And so this comes to the definition of precision and recall. So we have many different metrics how to uh, estimate the quality of our classifier. The one that you just saw in the, so far was so-called accuracy. And this one is just how many percent of the images were correctly classified. But this, accur this accuracy is not always the best case, right? Because for example, if you if you are classifying between tumors and non-tumors, so like malignant tumors, <laughs> and your data set is like thousand pictures or a CT scan or something like that, and you have just maybe 950 are non-tumor and 50 are tumor, and then if you calculate accuracy on these, then just using the dummy classifier, which is like always predicting that there's no tumor, you will have 95% accuracy, right? Because it's non-balanced data set. And so then you need to consider, and this is also our case, so our data set is not balanced, right? Because we have much more, for example, in our case, non-healthy ones and healthy ones. So accuracy doesn't necessarily, especially for two-class classification, binary classification, is not necessarily the best metric how to evaluate your model. So that's why we have precision and recall. So recall, what it actually is, is like how many of unhealthy we actually hit divided by how many of unhealthy there were in the, in the data set, right? So, so if you look in our confusion matrix here, so how many of unhealthy have we hit, right? So this is 23 obviously, right? So we classify 23 correctly, but there were altogether 24, right? Because this was true label was that it's unhealthy, but we classified it as so our recall will be 23 over 24, right? And this will tell you something that approximately, I don't know, 96% of, of all the non-healthy ones we call. And this is, this is pretty cool. And then we have, on the other hand, precision. And that's kind of opposite. It's like, how many unhealthy 
we have a, divided by how many unhealthy, we have said that they are actually unhealthy, right? So for our precision, okay, so again, this will be the same, so how many unhealthy we think 23, but how many unhealthy we actually said that they were unhealthy, that's 23 plus 6, right? Because this is our predicted label, so we, we said 29 images are not healthy, but actually just 23 of them were not healthy. Right, so your precision is just 23 over 29. Right, so it's so lower. So these two metrics, precision and recall, they're super important, and it's it's not very good if you deal with these classifiers in project just to say what is the accuracy, because accuracy can be very misleading. You know heard about this tumor example. Okay, so what do you think now? What would be more important in our case, recall or precision? Is it more important to have zero or lower value here or here? So, for the logistic regression, if we do this, uh, if we do this split, the default setting is that all the values that will be on this side, which basically means that this inside the square brackets will be uh, higher than zero. All these will be classified as healthy, and all these will be classified as unhealthy. But this is just the default setting. The, the threshold is here. We can move the threshold anywhere we want, right? So we can say that, for example, if the probability calculated for the healthy will be 60%, then still it's 40% that it's unhealthy, and we won't that still be classified as non-healthy, right? Because we want to have better recall. So, so we can move this threshold, and as we move this threshold and calculate for each point precision and recall, then we get what is called precision recall curve. And it's here. Right? 
So here you can see, we start with some threshold. Uh, okay, somewhere here. So, so this threshold will be that the precision will be 100%, but recall is 0%. And that's not recall, right? So, so and, and all these data points here represent different stages if we set threshold to different values. And this way, we will get different precision and recalls. So for example, if we want to have recall that is 100%, we will achieve this, but at the penalty of having precision just 80%. Or if we want to set that, okay, but we don't want to sacrifice the many healthy ones, because if precision is 80%, that means that also we will kill 20% of the good ones, which we actually do. <clears throat> then we can say, okay, let's, let's see here. So here we have recall maybe 90%, but precision is 85. So that's maybe a good compromise, right? So, and you can, you can tweak this, and look which one is better. And what I have prepared for, for this session, so what are the next steps? So this was just like data analysis pipeline that at least I, I usually do it this way. It, it was not like ordered, but it was like like a flow of ideas in real time. Uh, they are chronologically actually ordered. And so what else can be done? So as was already said, you can divide these pictures into maybe segments and wave some leaves and treat these leaves separately. And this way, you will have much bigger data, which is always better, right? You can do this. Then uh, you can look at some other feature extraction tools. For example, you can look at PCA, which stands for Principal Component Analysis. That's where you can use algorithmic and machine learning. This way, because if you have a picture that it's like 2,000, 2,000 characters, millions of pictures, and because every pixel you can say that is important, but of course they are not that important. We we extracted just 30 of them, and that's just one way how to do it. Not the wise one, but just one way. And if you use, for example, PCA on this picture, you can get out of this image maybe just 50 or just 10 pictures. Which can be can have that information just compressed. Right? Then you can use some outlay holders. That's another way, similar to PCA. But then you can just look at your image and just extract usually some simple neural network, uh, some interesting features. You can just Google these things up. And if you want to Google something like feature extraction from images, then you will find many other interesting algorithms how to get your features from your images. Of course, you don't need to use my Instagram, but that was just to illustrate something simple. Then, another step, you can use different models, right? We just try decision tree and logistic regression, which are basically pretty simple and, and nice to, to visualize and to understand. What I really like is, again, I should have said it in the beginning, is that start small, start with easier models, and then add complexity uh, gradually, right? Not at the beginning, because that's maybe not what is needed. Right? This is not needed, maybe. So, so use your uh, your model that your, your computer buys you. Uh, then you have different models, subtle vector machines, which are pretty famous, which is kind of a uh, better way of doing logistic regression than neural networks, convolutional neural networks. If you want to See other algorithms like this, just go to Google um, image classification and it will come up some other interesting algorithms that you can try and see what else. So, this is basically it from my side. If you have still some comments, questions, tell them now or be quiet forever. So, we can have a glass of wine and talk about. Have a glass of wine and talk about it. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thanks, Thanks.